hereby I open this academic ceremony in which Tatjana Makowski will defend the academic thesis, multimorbidity and quality of life epidemiological perspective from the European region. May I invite you to give a short summary of the research that you performed? Thank you very much. Dear Prorector, dear members of the assessment committee, dear supervisors, colleagues, family and friends, um, in short, in 15 minutes, I will present uh, my work, my PhD work, where we focused on investigating the link between multimorbidity and quality of life. Um, this slide is to set the scene for the subject because it will be mentioned also later that uh, multimorbidity increases with increasing age. And we can already observe that in the past 30 years, the percentage of people of age 65 and over has increased substantially, as well as the projections for 2050 uh, overall, globally, and also for Europe, where about 30% of the population by 2050 will be over age 65 and over, according to projections. Multimorbidity is usually defined as coexistence of two and more chronic conditions within the individual, and it's highly prevalent among older adults, but also is increasingly prevalent among younger adults as well. According to some uh, studies, approximately 78% of all GP visits are due to uh, patients with multimorbidity, which means that multimorbidity is rather the rule than the exception in practice. Multimorbidity can be observed in different ways, but in this dissertation, we focus on exploring multimorbidity as a disease count and disease combinations. Our main outcome of the study was quality of life. Quality of life by the World Health Organization is described as individuals perception of their position in life in the context of the culture and value system in which they live and in relation to their goals, expectations, standards and concerns. Related uh, concept to quality of life is health-related quality of life, which refers to health aspects of life quality. We, uh, these two terms are usually uh, sometimes used uh, interchangeably, and we use questionnaires to assess quality of life or health-related quality of life in patients or participants. Some of them be can be generic, such as an SF that we see here, or EQ, 5D, or CASP, and some of these, uh, these questionnaires will also reappear later. And some of the questions can also be disease specific, which means that they aim to investigate quality of life in patients um, of Alzheimer's disease, for example, or diabetes, among others. It is important to distinguish between the two related, however, distinct and different terms and concepts. Those are comorbidity and multimorbidity. Comorbidity implies the existence of a disease, which is called comorbid disease, in addition to an index already existing disease. And it rather has a centric, disease-centric approach. Multimorbidity, on the other hand, uh, does not give the precedence to any of the co-occurring conditions and aims to have a patient in, this, in the focus. This uh, slide is to give the, the glimpse of the complexity of the multimorbidity. Multimorbidity as a co-occurrence co of two or more chronic conditions implies usually increased number of visits to the medical professionalists, also in, involves uh, more specialists in the care for patients with multimorbidity, and usually that implies also use of multiple medications for patients with multimorbidity, also known as polypharmacy. That altogether may give complexity to the care of with patients with multimorbidity. In, in addition to this uh, complexity derived from multimorbidity itself, current organization of the healthcare system, which is disease-centered, does not allow a, a optimal care for patients with multimorbidity in a sense that it is disease-centered. Disease -centered. That means that uh, specialists will focus on a disease of their specialty, and should there be the lack of communication that happens quite often among them, that can result in conflicting recommendations. Uh, also uh, supported with disease-specific guidelines, which means as professionals, health professionals will rely on disease-specific guidelines to give uh, to choose a treatment for patients. That can also multiply medications for patients, um, may, uh, which may be redundant and sometimes with adverse events. Also may also duplicate the test for patients and overall additionally gives the complexity to the care of patients with multimorbidity, which tends to then be rather disease-centric than patient-centered. 
There are different uh, um, consequences of multimorbidity, but most uh, often no noted in literature is the increased likelihood of death, also functional decline and increased healthcare costs. But in this dissertation, we focused on the quality of life deterioration in patients with multimorbidity. What we wanted first is to assess the existing knowledge on the subject. Then we wanted to explore factors that play the role in, in the association between multimobility and quality of life besides socioeconomic factors, which are usually accounted for uh, when exploring this question. Then we wanted to observe how does this association behave over time and across European countries, and should there be the difference, uh, how may we explain them? Also, we wanted to see whether the diseases group together, and if they do, how do they relate to the quality of life? To explore the existing knowledge in, multi in the association between multimobility and quality of life, we conducted a systematic literature review where we looked in approximately 20,000 titles and abstracts on the subject. Um, and we summarized approximately 74, uh, have summarized 74 um, studies in the systematic review and almost half included in meta-analysis, that is the quantitative synthesis of the, of the data. We performed six meta-analysis models based on these quality of life scales, EQ5, DSF scales, some of them mentioned earlier. And on the right-hand side, you can see one meta-analysis model, actually the forest plot, where we combined all studies that use the same multimorbidity tool, in this case, increased disease count, and the same quality of life scale, in this case, EQ5D. And then we pulled the studies, their findings stood together to estimate the overall effect of quality of life decline with increasing number of diseases for this quality of life scale. There are many interesting findings that derive from this uh, systematic literature review. Um, what we have observed is that quality of life declines with each added disease from 1.6 to 4.4 percent, depending on the scale. That physical health was impacted more than mental, and as well as females and younger population groups. Then we explore the factors in the association between multimorbidity and quality of life. Uh, basing our study on the survey of health, aging, and retirement in Europe, which is a large European database that accounts for 28 European countries and Israel. It is for population of age 50 and older. It is a population study, which means that interviews are conducted in the households, but also in nursing homes, uh, uh, occasionally, depending on the country. It is a longitudinal study, which means that participants are invited to uh, participate in each wave. However, uh, new participants were also thought, sought. Quality of life scale that was used in this database was, uh, uh, was Control, Autonomy, Self-Realization and Pleasure Scale, or CASP. We used wave six to explore the factors in the association between multimobility and quality of life. And this wave accounted for 18 countries and 18 chronic conditions and approximately 70,000 participants. What we did first is that we um, performed something, a model that we call the base model. Uh, the way we estimated the, the number of diseases, the association between increasing number of diseases and quality of life accounting for socioeconomic factors such as age, sex, education, and others. We observed that quality of life decline with each other disease was 2.4% on the scale 0 to 100. And then thanks, uh, based on the literature that we explored and thanks to comprehensiveness of the database, we uh, identified other factors that we thought could be important in further explaining uh, quality of life decline. For example, symptoms such as pain, fatigue, falling, or treatment burden, polypharmacy, or number of times visited doctors. Some of these elements we also mentioned before. Um, social network and social support that it calls lonely, inc includes loneliness, for example, and limitation with activities of daily living, such as, for example, washing uh, or eating or walking across the room, or limitation with more complex activities, such as grocery shopping, using the phone, among others. We included these elements one at a time in the base model, and those that are appeared uh, relevant are highlighted here. And then we added them to the base model, and our final model now showed a decline of 0.8% decline uh, in quality of life with each other disease, which means that each of these factors explain independently quality of life decline in addition to disease burden and socioeconomic factors we uh, had before. Um, then we wanted to see how does this association behave over time and across European countries. 
we then used four uh, waves in the time span of 10 years. In the, uh, the study included 21 countries and we had 16 chronic conditions because we wanted to use all the conditions that, was, that were present across all four waves. And we had 106, over 106,000 participants for the study. There was no change in quality of life over time. And on average, quality of life declined from 1.8% with each added disease. However, we noticed that there were differences between European countries, and we used some of these variables to potentially explore the differences between them, such as countries' GDP or investment in health on sun exposure, or belonging to the European region, where we grouped the countries for the countries of the north, south, east, and west, and also number of integrated care programs. Uh, integrated care programs aim to integrate care for patients, which means that they combine different specialties um, to better to provide uh, potentially more optimal care for patients with multimorbidity. And we found this variable relevant to include also in our, in our analysis. Those that appear significant were countries' GDP and investment in health in a sense that uh, for countries that had higher GDP and higher investment in health, uh, quality of life decline was less steep with increasing number of diseases. For the European regions, countries of the South and East presented a steeper quality of life decline um, with increased number of diseases compared to the West and the North of the European region. Other two variables did not appear significant in our study. Then we wanted to zoom in more in the, in the differences between the countries. Uh, and we can see that Denmark, Sweden, and Switzerland had uh, the least decline in quality of life, and Spain, Croatia, and Greece presented the steepest decline in quality of life. And finally, we wanted to observe how the, the diseases group together. Do they group together? And how do the groups associate with quality of life? We went back to wave six, and we, using a factor analysis, we said we have identified three patterns which were very similar for men and women. For example, cardiometabolic pattern included heart disease and uh, vascular diseases, and also diabetes for both sex groups. Psychogeriatric pattern included Alzheimer and stroke, and also two other diseases for men. While well, mixed pattern combined um, different chronic conditions across different body systems, and it was large, uh, rather complex for clinical interpretation. Then we estimated the prevalence or the frequency of these patterns in the population. So we have observed that the cardiometabolic pattern was the, the most pre uh, present, most prevalent in the population for both men and women, and that the psychogeriatric pattern was least prevalent. However, after accounting, when we observed the association between uh, patterns and quality of life decline, adjusting for socioeconomic factors and other factors we identified previously as relevant in quality of life decline, this pattern presented the steepest quality of life decline compared to other patterns. And few concluding remarks. Um, quality of life declines. We have underlined that quality of life declines with increasing number of diseases. Uh, we have noted the differences between the countries of Europe and we try to explain them. Then that we have noted that the groups, the diseases also group together and that they associate differently with quality of life and that there are other elements beside disease burden and socioeconomic burden that can explain the quality of life decline. Um, and those could be better managed with the better clinical and public health services. And in that sense, maybe tailored better to patients for aiming for patient-centered rather than disease-centered uh, care for patients with multimorbidity, um, what, we aim, what we think believe to be more optimal. We also try to depict this with this image and a special thank you to my nephew, Mario Vetig, an artist who made this image for a purpose of this project only. So the colorful body of the, of the woman presents multimorbidity and that the lightness of the moment is quality of life or good quality of life uh, despite multimorbidity and thanks to tailored or more patient-centered care presented with circles and flowers underneath. Thank you very much uh, for the attention and the prorector, I give back the word to you. Thank you very much for this uh, clear presentation and indeed a, a beautiful illustration. 
The opposition will be opened by the chair of the assessment committee, Professor Bosma, and he is a professor of social epidemiology at Maastricht University. Thank you. Well, dear, dear candidate, let me first congratulate you with this accomplishment. I also like to include your supervisors uh, in this praise. Using advanced epidemiological methods, you have shown that the dominant single disease orientation is really obsolete. A more holistic and integrated view is much more appropriate in current aging societies. General practitioners not only see people with a single disease, many have multiple diseases. You are right, given its subjective and holistic nature, quality of life is a key characteristic to look at, uh, particularly in people with multiple diseases. Your thesis provides really convincing evidence on how multimorbidity is related to quality of life in people and how that information informs health promoting interventions in the healthcare sector. Still, of course, I still would like to know your thoughts on some questions that I have when reading your work. I think one of the, the, the key things is that you want to know the association between multimorbidity and quality of life. And now I saw had different numbers, uh, percentages, uh, decrease in health related uh, quality of life. Uh, but could you maybe say something that the coefficients also differ very much between studies? Could you give an indication, because I cannot read it in your thesis, could you give an indication about how strong the association is between multi-mobility and quality of life? Is it, could, you, could you say, is it strong, moderate or weak? Um, highly esteemed opponent, thank you very much for your question. Um, the quality of life scale that we use is CASP, that is a quality of life scale uh, that does not have a clinical, um, clinical estimation of the relevance, actually, because we, for some scales, usually for uh, health related quality of life scales, that would, uh, that could translate into the clinical relevance of the decline, but for CASP, unfortunately, that was not possible to, to estimate. We were also in touch with the team that worked on the quality of life scale, and um, they are trying to do something in that direction. Um, Strong, I do believe that it's significant, and I do believe that is uh, strong <laughs> quality of life decline that can impact the, the quality of life in patients with multimorbidity. I think that can also be very individual, um, how someone perceives the quality of life decline of 2.4%. Uh, it's certainly stronger than 0.8%. So, so I, I think what we wanted to try to prove here is that other elements can also be significant in elevating quality, poor quality of life in patients with multimorbidity. But uh, quality of life at the end is very subjective. Of course, but, but do, do you think, uh, because I saw now in your presentation that the decreases eight or less than 10% with each increase in disease. Yes. And, but, but can you say, is that true? Uh, independent of the clinical significance, do you think that is strong or is it moderate or weak? I think that what we missed here is the, the severity of the illness. And once if we would add the severity of the illness to the overall quality of life decline, we would be maybe able to estimate on the individual basis if that is actually stronger for that particular patient or particular patient group. I understand that 0.8% on the scale of 0 to 100 maybe does not appear so um, so much, but um, when we add other elements such as uh, disease severity, I think it may add the weight even more than 0.8%. Mm -hmm. Because we here gave uh, didn't give the weight to the disease, which means that each diseases were the, treated the same, which is no. also a limitation of the study for sure. No. Using limitation in general for using using the, the uh, increasing number of diseases or number of diseases to measure multimorbidity. However, it's a good estimate of the burden. Yeah. If we particularly if we don't have any better. And 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 it is of course also so 
that, uh, that you find this association across all kinds of studies that you do and also in the systematic review. So there is also consistency in the yeah. effect and it's not, and not a, a chance uh, finding or something like that. But related to uh, the, the, uh, to the type of, the, you say the type of disease, but I also wondered whether you thought about that maybe the first disease has a stronger impact on the health related quality of life than any subsequent diseases. And did you not look at maybe modeling this in, the, in, in your analysis? Yes, but I think you're referring to is linear association with the number of diseases and the quality of life decline. Um, so the, in the systematic review, we had to use uh, the linear model uh, to because all the studies that we based our meta-analysis were using the linear model to estimate the association between multimorbidity and quality of life. And it's also because uh, some of them found that, for example, linear and uh, other models, uh, but quadratic model, I believe, that mm -hmm. actually they performed mm -hmm. the same. So there was no need to, to use a more complex model. Mm -hmm. That's how they interpret it. On, in our case, we did look into how the how the in share uh, quality of uh, multimobility, increasing number of diseases associated with quality of life, and you, we used some tests to do that. For example, um, uh, polynomials, fractional polynomials. We use that to actually see how does the um, how the two variables relate, uh, number of diseases and quality of life, and it did present a linear association. Mm -hmm. Also, we compared the group. Uh, it was a median a mean quality of life per disease group that we compared, and it further had a linear as well presentation. Um, there are some studies that maybe would agree, in a sense, with you, uh, that maybe the first one would have the strongest impact, but there are also some other studies that they say that quality of life also declines from first from one to four diseases and then flattens, or that after, and it's also not static, it doesn't mean that it's going to continue to decline after first the second disease, because also uh, population of people accommodate, accustomed uh, to having a disease. So it, this effect on quality of life becomes less with time as well. And sometimes it aggravates also depends of the management of the care, how this disease behave, and also how is care um, managed for the patient to actually have them deal with it. No. Okay, thank you. Uh, maybe a completely different question that I have. Uh, and that question relates to the social economic status. I'm a professor of social epidemiology, so I'm particularly interested in the socioeconomic inequalities uh, in health. Um, I see strong associations in the whole thesis uh, between social low socioeconomic status and multimorbidity, mobility and also a compromised quality of life. Uh, it is thus important as you do to control for social economic circumstances. At the same time, by controlling for socioeconomic circumstances, and I can see that it has a big impact when you control for socioeconomic circumstances. Uh, when, when you control the association between multimobility and quality of life, socioeconomic circumstances, you can see the strong impact from socioeconomic background, socioeconomic inequalities. So by controlling for it, one could say, as I do, uh, you rub out the inequalities that work in the background. Mm -hmm. In your prospective study, to continue, in your prospective study, you find that the economic context, which you also showed, at a GDP, at a gross domestic product of a country, protects, in a certain way, protects against strong effects of multimorbidity on quality of life. So countries with a larger GDP show smaller associations. And in your recommendations, I foremost see the expected benefits of promoting integrated care for patients with multiple diseases. And that's the main, uh, more integrated care, main recommendation. But do you not think, given the, the big impact of the social economic status in the individual analysis, and uh, uh, which indicates strong effects of social economic status on multimorbidity and quality of life, and also the wealth of a country, the GDP, uh, in, which has a protective effect, do you not think that we should not also do something on the social economic inequalities between countries, but also within countries? How strong, in other words, how strong is the effect of social economic status 
uh, and low social economic status in particular, uh, and should not should that not also be addressed to tackle the cause of the problems, maybe more at its roots. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yes, I absolutely agree about that. And we have, though that was not particular, our focus in the research um, and the socioeconomic factors, we did observe that people with lower socioeconomic status had uh, um, had more multimobilities. Um, and uh, so that was also proven in our study. Um, uh, absolutely. For example, in some of the studies, I have read that, for example, socioeconomic factors contribute 35 to 55 percent to health outcomes, which is extremely high. Um, now, the problem is how can we actually do that? We can't make everyone rich, um, and um, and also, but we can definitely make uh, services like uh, public health services better, or social services better, or we maybe in the in the contact uh, patient uh, doctor contact, we can also investigate are there other circumstances that actually contribute to this quality of life decline and overall poor health state that are unrelated to health. For example, do people feel lonely? Do the, can they actually interpret the, um, the treatment or medications that they are given? Um, so those are the things that in the in a socioeconomic um, context can uh, maybe make the inequalities smaller. Um, and improve overall the health and, and the quality of life. That can be, of course, looked across the countries and also within the countries. And uh, there are different ways, I uh, assume, to, to investigate also, like to, to also to find the groups who, who are socioeconomically deprived um, and in the, in the group level, but also the individual, individual level. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I hear very good recommendations, additional recommendations, addressing also, yeah, more environmental, more structural upstream factors, mm -hmm. causing differences, major differences in health in each of the studies that I look and I see your study, I see it again. And, but could you maybe, as, 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 a, as a last mm -hmm. question, could you maybe give an idea about how wealth, why wealthy countries why the association between multimobility and quality of life is smaller in wealthy countries than in poor countries. Yes, I did think about that. And of course, that can be, um, that includes some of the things that I've said, for example, that uh, better living conditions in the countries that are better off, uh, so that they have better living conditions, that they have access to more quality food, that they have maybe access to better education, that they live in, the, in a better environment, where they can actually grow um, uh, and prosper in physical and psychological manner. Um, that can be one of the reasons also maybe better quality, uh, better quality of uh, care. May, even though in Europe we do have the um, equal access to healthcare for everyone, theoretically, uh, but does that actually mean that everyone has the access to the care and also access to the good quality care, mm -hmm. which is absolutely important. Um, and to also the services, social services that they may be more or less developed in, in, in richer countries that they can then invest more in supporting um, other services and um, patients and uh, participants in that sense. Um, okay. Well, very good. I'm uh, very happy with your question, uh, with your <laughs> answer, sorry. <laughs> I give the word back to the director. Thank you very much. The opposition will be continued by Professor uh, Beurskens. She was a member of the assessment committee, is today the secretary of uh, the Corona, and she is a professor of goal-oriented measurement in patient care at Maastricht University. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, yeah, dear candidate, my compliment for you and your supervisors, supervisors, not on, on site, but online, mm -hmm. uh, for conducting and writing this uh, nice, well-written dissertation. Mm -hmm. And I'm very impressed, not also about your dissertation, but also by your curriculum vitae and your various expertise in medicine, public health, epidemiology, and also music, <laughs> nice to read. Mm -hmm. And also your love for the languages. And I was impressed that I saw summaries in English, Dutch, Serbian, Serbian, mm -hmm. the right, <laughs> French and Lu Luxembourgish. I thought it was German, but when I started reading, I said, no, that's not German. That's mm -hmm. a different uh, language. It's very impressive. And I would talk about, uh, would like to talk about you with the concept of quality of life. 
two concepts are important in your thesis, multimorbidity and quality of life. Um, and one of your research questions focused on the operational definition of multimorbidity as compared to comorbidity. And there is no research question or elaboration about the definition of quality of life. And to start with, can you explain to me what you mean in your thesis by quality of life? What I mean by excuse quality me. of life. What is quality of life to you? Um, highly esteemed opponent, <laughs> thank you very much for the kind words and for the question. Um, it is uh, true that we defined multimobility a lot uh, in the study and quality of life. We used uh, the quality of life scales. Um, while doing the systematic literature review, I have identified, uh, we have identified many quality of life scales and health related quality of life scales. And since they were so um, in interchangeably used, uh, I had to first make the sense uh, why and how. And um, the quality of life, we the definitions we used uh, was in the, in the thesis in the beginning, I actually used only the definition of WHO, which I think, uh, to my knowledge, is the only definition of quality of life. But how they're interpreted depends on the quality of life questionnaires that we use. So um, we used uh, to identify, uh, to define quality of life is the scales that we had. Uh, so, for example, CASP for us, that was uh, quality but, but of life. If I, if yeah. I, if I may, um, your questionnaires are patient reported outcome measures. And I would like to discuss with you about the patient reported outcomes before we go to the measures. Okay. Which outcomes are important in, according to you, in quality of life? According to me, there would be health outcomes, but also besides those would be others uh, like uh, spirituality that is important for people in an environment uh, that the people live. So I would go broader than quality, than health related quality of life, which focuses only on the um, health aspects of uh, life quality. And I think that's particularly important for the patients with multimorbidity because they also need social support. They um, also, if they're limited in activities of daily living, they also, it, it matters where they live and in which conditions they live as well. So I would, um, in that sense, yes, our definition, our interpretation of quality of life was broader than only health related. Mm -hmm. And um, how, how, what is the relation, according to you, with, with concept as well-being and social participation? Well, being uh, in, in, in the definition that I have found uh, by um, ISOCOL, International Society for Quality of Life, they, defi they define uh, well-being as a positive perception of the patient's life, uh, like sources, resources that patients have, while, for example, quality of life or health-related quality of life in particular focuses on the negative aspects, other than the, the lacks in, in uh, either in patient's health status or the quality of the care that is provided. Mm -hmm. And uh, you mentioned social participation. Social participation. Or participation. Yes, we uh, we use the social participation variable uh, in, is uh, that we derived from, from SHARE, if that's what you're referring to. Um, that is the participation in activities, social activities that uh, people in Europe do. And that can uh, increase their hopefully their well-being, their positive attitude towards life. Mm -hmm. So those are linked, but to me are not the same. And um, why did you choose for um, quality of life as main outcome and not for well-being or participation? Um, because the quality of life, for example, is for patients with multimobility set as one of the main outcomes in the research. Um, so that is one of the reasons. And also share database, uh, it, it does use uh, CASP quality of life questionnaire, which is well defined with all elements in the questions. And there were very few missing values. And so that was um, the two main reasons. Okay, that's mainly because it's for patients with multimobility mm -hmm. rather very important. Uh, do you think that the, that the relation between multimorbidity and concepts like well-being and social participation would be different if you compare to the relation with multimorbidity and quality of life? Maybe that depends on the questionnaire. For example, the CASP, uh, it is meant uh, to underline rather positive aspects of aging. 
uh, which to me is very closely linked to definition of well-being and uh, social participation, I think, uh, can maybe encourage uh, social participation. So it can both work both ways. I think if people are happier, then participate more. If they're, they associate, um, integrate more into the society, their well-being and quality of life can improve. So I think, um, yes, I think CASP in our case, maybe is closer to well-being. Um, that we wanted to use. But you found the shame uh -huh. results. Would I, uh, well, we didn't investigate well being, actually. We didn't investigate well being or social participation. But what do you expect? For well being, um, I think that uh, for this, if we use the outcome social participation, you mean? In, in our um, study, there are very few people, uh, like almost 45% of people were not socially active in, in Europe. So um, I think if that was our outcome, we would notice that uh, they didn't participate as, as much as we uh, anticipated, maybe. Mm -hmm. uh, is that linked to their quality of life uh, or their well-being? Uh, I think... Um, those are different variables for me, and maybe not the same outcome, I, I would assume. Mm -hmm. But, but a, a bit related question. Um, do you think that activity of daily living, for example, I, uh, you use that as a, is that a predictor or mediator, or mm -hmm. should we see it as an outcome? Uh, there are studies, in, the, in our case, we use it as a confounding factor. Mm -hmm. uh, there are studies that show that it can be a mediator, and that is true because uh, be pa patients with multimorbidity can um, have can be more limited in, in in terms of activities and instrumental activities of daily living, which may lead further to deterioration of quality of life. Um, however, uh, we that was not the aim in our study. We didn't want to investigate the pathways between multimorbidity and quality mm -hmm. of life. However, we did take into consideration that variable, and as we deemed, it was very important. But that is certainly a very interesting question, mm -hmm. of course. But but if you, I started with asking which components are in your quality of life, and if you look at the questions, the outcomes in the concept of quality of life, because it is a merged concept, eh, then there are questions about daily activities mm -hmm. included in quality of life questions. So some a bit strange to use as a predictor because it is also integrated in, in your outcome. Yes, that may be what you're referring to, maybe uh, over adjustment is mm -hmm. what you mean. Um, there may be some overlap in the questions. I think that CASP does not really include um, the limitation in a sense. No, not CASP. Not no. CASP, yeah. okay, yes. Maybe in that sense, maybe less. Uh, it had less impact on our analysis. Um, and we also tested for correlation between the variables. So we uh, didn't observe any very strong correlation between um, that may impact interfere. Mm -hmm. um, can I continue? Yeah. Um, can one of your panelists read Proposition 5? Yeah. Proposition number five. Measuring quality of life using scales may not always capture what matters to an individual patient. Targeted context specific questions and tailored actions could give more results in improving patient qual life quality. Mm -hmm. And I'm very curious what you mean with target context specific questions. Yes, I thought about that um, because uh, I did find the quality of life scales that we use are very useful. And uh, they can also show the difference uh, impaired um, impairments in certain areas for quality of life for patients. And particularly if they persist, we can see uh, that something has not improved or that we didn't, didn't haven't done enough uh, to improve that particular aspect. But if we just ask the patient, okay, how is your mobility? Um, uh, I'm not really sure if that actually gives the improvement. Uh, we will know that their mobility is maybe uh, less and it remains less. But for these specific questions, what I meant is because I um, also was in touch with an American team who actually said that it, it was very useful for patients for multimobility to actually ask very specific questions in a sense. 
okay, if something is to improve your quality of life, what do you think that would be? And they said, uh, I would be very happy to be able to watch my grandchildren once a week. And then they tried to work around these questions to see how that would be possible for them. Um, and that, um, that's actually what I meant. Was, yeah, yeah I, I think that's a very interesting area because um, the quality of life concepts and questionnaires are more umbrella concepts yeah. and for individual patients, um, yeah, not everybody likes to walk outside or whatever. So very mm -hmm. individual um, uh, questions could improve. And that's also the, the discussion in literature about those umbrella concepts and to look at the outcomes where I started with that question. Mm -hmm. And a lot of quality of life questions are very normative. Eh? Mm -hmm. What is a high quality of life? Yes. Yeah. So yeah. A, a very nice area to do research. In. Yes, it's very interesting for me. That's why I went even maybe uh, off the topic, in, not off the topic, but maybe a little bit more detail in it um, that it um, was supposed to be done. But I found that extremely interesting and very patient specific. OK, thank, thank you very you. much. Okay. The opposition will be continued now by Professor Rijken. She's a professor of international health and social care. Unfortunately, she could not be present today here, but she is online from Finland, I assume. And please, uh, the word is yours. Thank you, Chair. Um, esteemed candidate, uh, first, I want to compliment you with your dissertation. I think uh, it comprises a number of uh, studies that differ in methods, uh, but they all touch on uh, yeah, some of the major issues that uh, health is being faced today, and that is how to provide quality care uh, to an increasingly uh, older population, uh, population with increasingly more mobility. Can you hear me well? Because I'm not sure. Yeah. Uh, excuse me, uh, maybe you can adjust your microphone. Could that, there be a problem with the microphone? Because I assume you couldn't understand yeah, couldn't the answer very well. I'm sorry. Yeah. I will try, but. Yeah. Boris. Can you hear me well now? Yeah. Apologies. Then. Um, I will repeat my uh, my question. Um, first, I wanted to compliment you, uh, Tatiana, because I think you had uh, done a very good job with this dissertation. And I said it comprised a number of uh, studies that, that all apply different methods, but that all touch on some of the major issues that health systems in Europe face today. Um, and that is how to provide good quality care to populations uh, that are aging and that are increasingly confronted with multimorbidity. And um, actually, I think when it comes about good quality of care, it is mainly about maintaining and improving the quality of life for people with multimorbidity. So that is why I think that your dissertation will not only be read by academics, but that also policymakers will read your dissertation with great interest. Now, I hope you can understand me because I want to, uh, to ask you some questions about chapter seven. Um, um, I thought this uh, chapter particularly relevant because of your attempt to cluster uh, chronic disease combinations, uh, which may then provide valuable starting points for building more integrated uh, care pathways for people with multimorbidity. Now, I first would like you to clarify something to me. Um, in the, the study, uh, you aim to identify multimorbidity patterns. And for this, you use the shared data and then you conduct this factor analysis. Um, you have the data from more than 60, uh, 67,000 uh, people. Um, and then you enter 17 chronic conditions and also some controlling variables and you do this factor analysis. But half of the people in the sample do not have two or more chronic conditions. So actually half of the people are not people with multimorbidity. Um, 
And you also use the definition that multimorbidity is about the coexistence of two or more conditions within a person. So my question is first, um, why did you not exclude those people that did not have, who did not have multimorbidity from the factor analysis? Can you explain that to me? for your question. Um, yes, we had a lengthy discussion in our team about the same question and uh, with our uh, statistician who is an expert in, in uh, factor analysis, she advised us that it would not be advisable to actually conduct estimates the patterns on the, only on the population uh, with two or more chronic conditions, because that would actually overestimate. First, it would it would overestimate the the, the prevalence of the patterns in the population, because we would exclude the denominator of zero and one diseases the population with zero and one diseases as well. So that will give the overestimation of the pattern. Plus, when we include, uh, when we estimate the association between uh, patterns and quality of life, we needed to have a reference group as well that includes also patients with zero and one diseases to get the better estimate of the decline. Okay, but did you, because I can imagine that you still did it, that you still conducted the analysis also uh, with uh, only the people with multimorbidity, or didn't you? Because I can imagine that you may have seen well, that, you, that, you, that you have different results then, or not. Is it doesn't make such a difference. <laughs> I I cannot, I think I gave up on, on doing that after her advice. So I believe I didn't do that, but that is, that is a good uh, question. And also I um, have, um, I have as well discussed that with a colleague, another colleague who said that since the diseases are combined on the base of the correlations, if we have zero or one disease, we would not have uh, diseases to correlate. So she also uh, was not in favor of that, but that's um, something I yeah, could have done, yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, then a question about the results of the factor analysis. You know, I'm very interested in this because I think this is really something that, that we may need, huh? because if we can then uh, identify these combinations, then that may be helpful also for uh, reforming care huh? and that, that you can really consider more integrated care for people with certain combinations of uh, diseases. But when I saw the result of the factor analysis, I was a bit disappointed. Um, because uh, you have uh, then, well, you, 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 you ended up with interpreting three factors. One is this mixed factor, and then you have the two other patterns. Um, but the mixed pattern, uh, factor, that is really something, yeah, you know, there's not, that you cannot interpret it in clinically. Um, but the other two, they looked already quite familiar to me. And I think as a medical doctor, I understand you are a medical doctor. I, I thought, well, if you are sitting on the table together with some colleagues, you would have proposed perhaps already these clusters. So can you, does it have some added value for you to do this factor analysis? Did, you, did it provide new insights to you that you could, um, think of and that it or would you suggest to do it in a different way next time it's true that we have identified the patterns that were maybe um that, that was in line with with the literature but to me that was actually a good thing because uh, had we found something completely strange and it was all we would also wonder what uh, about the findings maybe Maybe yes, maybe no. But for me, it is interesting and it is a positive thing that we have identified the same factors, which means that this the idea that we have for the integrated care around the diseases and conditions that group together uh, makes sense. It is true that from the clinician, the clinicians, this idea may come, and we do, do need that to come from the clinicians. But I also wonder, even do clinicians then really do come and sit together, clinicians from these particular diseases that we have identified? Is that still the is that the case? Because um, we did find them in the literature and they're in line with the literature, but I'm not really sure if that has translated in the practice. Do the clinical guidelines account for these diseases that we have found uh, and do the specialists come actually together to discuss it around the patient? So it's more maybe that. Um, so, um, yeah. 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 
Then I, I, I want to ask another question, and I, I think I will ask only one final question now because I, I see it's diff, diff, difficult for you to hear me. But it, this is also about chapter seven. In the introduction, you write that it is essential to detect multimorbidity patterns that possibly have the most deteriorating effect on quality of life yeah, for ensuring more targeted and timely care. Now, this is, I fully agree, this is what, what we need. Um, because yeah, if you know who are those people with the poorest quality of life that may, that may provide clues for, for care uh, for these people. But to my opinion, you do not detect disease patterns that are associated with a poor quality of life. That's maybe because that was not the main focus of the study. Yeah, so you look at the quality of life for those patterns that you find based on the factor analysis. But if you could you, I want to invite you to reflect on an approach, an alternative approach, if you will really want if the main question would be, can I identify multimorbidity clusters patterns that really are those with related to, to the poor, to the poorest quality of life? Would you then do it differently, or can you think of an alternative way? Hmm. Um, Perhaps start on the mean, other side. Maybe yes. Hello, sorry. Um, what we, there could be a different way to do that. Um, we were interested to estimate the prevalence in the population of the patterns first to see how the diseases group. I think that was very interesting on one side that was um, interesting information to have and also to associate them with quality of life. So that was one way to do, one way to do. but we, there is, I assume different ways to do that. One I could think of, for example, is to find the diseases that may have individually the strongest impact on quality of life and see how they pair with other diseases. Potentially that could be um, another way to do it. Um, and I think it would also support the findings in different ways, like who are the diseases um, that, so who that impact quality of life decline. So maybe there are different only ways to look at it. Um, yeah. Yeah. I think this is also an interesting approach to uh, further explore. But also, I, I give back to the chair now because uh, it is a bit difficult. I, uh, I see. Um, thank you very much for clarifying a lot to me. Thank you. Well, the quality really improved uh, after the initial uh, hurdle. Okay. So I think okay. okay. Yes. So thank you. Um, then we move on to Dr. Janssen, and she's an associate professor at the Department of Family Medicine of Maastricht University. Thank you. Dear candidates, um, like the previous committee members, I would like to congratulate you and your supervisory team present here today, as well as online with um, a really great thesis. It's well-written, rigorous research, um, and it's a timely and very challenging topic that you have tried to tackle in your, in your work. Um, I also like the fact that it's a very European thesis. Not only have you looked at different European countries, uh, but when I looked at your CV, um, I was impressed with all the different places in Europe that you've lived and worked. Mm -hmm. And um, and 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 as as uh, Professor Burkins, Burkins mentioned, the different languages that you speak, like five different languages. I think that's very impressive. With the ambition to learn even more languages. Um, and I, I also think it's important in current times um, that, that, that we have more people like you who build bridges across countries, across institutions, uh, across research topics and fields, but also across um, academia and culture, like the fact that you play the piano very well. I think that's, that's a really nice addition uh, to your um, academic CV. Um, and so it's a pleasure to, to serve on your, on your committee. Um, so my background is in patient-centered care, uh, and, and so my question naturally relates to that uh, area of research. Um, and so I was very pleased to read your proposition number seven, uh, maybe one of your um, paranyms could read it out loud.
integrated patient-focused and patient-tailored care is more providing, promising in improving health outcomes in the context of multimorbidity and specialized disease-centered approach. Thank you. Yes, so um, of course I, I very much agree with that uh, proposition, um, but I was wondering if we could maybe exchange some thoughts on how you can use the concept of multimorbidity to achieve patient-centered care. Um, especially since, um, particularly in chapter five, but also in other chapters, your research, research shows that, um, that factors other than multimorbidity, so clinical, social, and functional factors, to a very large ex extent uh, explain the association between the number of conditions that someone has and their um, quality of life and the decline in quality of life. So, um, so maybe I'm playing the devil, devil's advocate here, but I was just wondering what the added value is of measuring multimorbidity in studies like yours. And shouldn't we actually focus on, on those other factors that you found were very predictive of quality of life? So that's my first question. Um, esteemed opponent, thank you very much for your kind words and compliments and for your question. Um, so we, uh, we have identified many factors that are significant in, in, in the care for patients outside of disease burden. And, uh, but however, disease uh, burden has remained significant in our model as well. And I think as, as clinicians, uh, we have a moral duty to, to, to treat the, the patient, the, however, the disease. So we cannot really only focus on symptoms or the other elements. The point of this study was actually to, to uh, make aware the clinicians uh, in case they are not, and occasion they are not either because they are not or because they don't have enough time to investigate. That, for example, they should uh, investigate symptoms rather. Pain, for example, can come across very often in this discussion, but less so uh, fear of falling, which can be very limiting in socially, uh, socially uh, for a patient. Um, so I do think that uh, we should, uh, in patient-centered care, um, investigate these elements in addition to, to impaired health to see how patient's quality of life can be improved in a sense, uh, managing symptoms or also if the patients can, um, can go to the medical uh, provider. Uh, do they have the means? Do they have a support by family or friends? Do they, uh, does that, that cost? Um, how can we actually organize better that they meet at once uh, several professionals? Um, and in, in, in that sense, uh, that's what I meant with this. Yes. So in, in your in future research or um, for other people who are doing similar research to yours, what would you recommend as, um, first of all, how would you recommend them to measure multimorbidity? So in your first chapter, you described the very narrow definitions of counting disease, yeah. but there's also more wider approaches to measuring multimorbidity. So that would be my first question. But which other factors do you think people should definitely always include when they look at the impact of multimorbidity on quality of life? Uh, so better ways to measure multimorbidity is to use uh, the, the way to add, add the weights to the disease with, in terms of the severity and maybe length of living with the disease. Uh, that can add additional weight paired with a number of diseases. Uh, there are also some indices like comorbidity, Charleston comorbidity index, which is not meant for patients with multimorbidity, but it has the same tendency. So it does give the weight to the diseases, so they're not counted and weighted the same. So for example, in that sense, we can uh, measure multimorbidity um, and to investigate other elements. I think the treatment burden is absolutely uh, necessary to get investigate further for patients with multimorbidity for any patient, but uh, in particular for patients with multimorbidity because it can be uh, overwhelming for a patient to manage uh, just to have the many diseases, but also to manage them like polypharmacy and going to the appointments with the different physicians and uh, comply with the treatment regime. So that would be one of the of the factors for definitely that that is worth exploring uh, further. If I am to choose one, for example, yes. Okay, thank you. That's very very helpful. Um, so I I have another question which is related to uh, to this point. Um, so in chapter three, you uh, you acknowledge the subjectivity in assessing quality of life, and in response to Professor Burskin's questions, you've already expanded a bit on that uh, on that topic, um, and you say that scales cannot always capture um, what may be important to an individual patient, uh, and so you recommend that is it, that it is important to explore the experiences of individuals uh, who are living with multiple conditions. 
uh, using qualitative research. Um, and so I was wondering, because in your own thesis, uh, the focus is on quantitative work, how, how would you have added qualitative uh, elements to your work to achieve this aim? <laughs> you are, are allowed to answer the question shortly, but you're not obliged to do that. <laughs> okay. It's okay, I can, I, I, I can answer. I wish I had a chance to also include qualitative study in, in addition to quantitative, but um, we had a lot of work <laughs> with quantitative things. And uh, I, I wish I had a chance also to talk to, to patients or to, to physicians to actually see how that question can be investigated in quant a qualitative sense to get more from that. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Okay. Tatjana Makowski, the time appointed for defending the thesis has passed. The degree com committee will now uh, withdraw to discuss the quality of your thesis and your defense. I request that you and your company await the results of our deliberations and our return in this room. Thank you.
Dear Tatjana Makowski, the degree committee here present has assessed the quality of your thesis and your defense. In view of its positive verdict and taking into account your previous qualifications, the degree co committee has decided to grant you the degree of doctor. Professor Zegers is authorized to confer upon you this academic distinction in accordance with Dutch university custom. I invite your supervisor to now take the floor. Do you promise to work in accordance with the principles of scientific integrity at all times, to be careful and honest, transparent, independent and responsible yes i promise by the authority fastened in us by law and in conformity with the decision of the committee here present i hereby confer upon you tatiana markovsky the degree of doctor and grant you all rights attached by custom and law as evidence of this i now present you the degree certificate signed by the rector the secretary and all the members of the committee and affixed with the official seal of the university. The last no doubt you can now start by uh, Dr. Severio Strange. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank, you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. So it has been uh, my honor to be one of the supervisors of Dr. Tatiana Makowski. I've known Tatiana since 2015 when I was appointed as a scientific director of of the Department of Population Health at the Luxembourg Institute of Health. At that time, Tatiana was working as a senior curriculum developer at the University of Luxembourg to establish the first medical school in Luxembourg, which was an amazing responsibility for uh, Tatiana. Since my very first meeting with her, I was impressed by her intelligence, dedication, and passion to research alongside her human touch. We struggled a bit to find the most suitable academic institution for her PhD until the happy marriage with the Maastricht University and my colleagues, Marianne and Morris Zegers. Tatiana became very interested in the topic of multimorbidity and was able to develop a wide collaborative network of peers and colleagues across different countries. After I moved to Canada in 2016 to take my current role as chair of epidemiology at Western University, we kept working together with Tatiana on a regular basis, and she was able to uh, even visit my institution in the summer of 2017 for our summer school. In closing, I want to say that Tatiana is an extraordinary human being, and she's also a very talented scholar. I trust that she will become an international leader in the field of multimorbidity research, as she's able to combine research with the policy initiatives and knowledge translation activities. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Severio. Then I'm the one to continue. Dear Dr. Markovsky, dear Tatiana. I'm very pleased and honored to be among the first to congratulate you with this well-deserved PhD. 
Looking back in my old files, I found your CD and a first PhD draft proposal, and they were both dated in the first months of 2016. And I have to say that although some changes were made, already at that time, you had a very clear picture of the aims, objectives, and relevance. And since our collaboration started in the beginning of 2016, I have come to know you as a person with whom it's really great fun to work. Not in the least because you're rather undisturbed and it appears almost impossible to scare you off with big databases, large number of files to go through or anything else. The first study you performed for your thesis was the systematic review, which you also mentioned in your presentation. And I must say, I've been actively involved in quite some systematic reviews, but never did I score almost 20,000 titles and abstracts for one review. When we, you first found out that the number of hits was so high, we did try to limit and focus the search, but you were afraid to lose valuable references. And as a couple of monks, we went through all 20,000 of them and it paid off resulting in the first comprehensive review on multimorbidity and quality of life without any restrictions to the setting or patient characteristics. And even based on the same search in collaboration with Suzanne Smith, you did an additional analysis applying the Bayesian hierarchical models, which you performed very well and were published as well. For some of the other chapters, you used the large European share database, which you faced with similar vigor, learning a lot about statistics and stata. And with your very well-developed social skills, you've built a large circle of experts around you for st statistical support throughout Europe, Europe was mentioned before, and even reaching, reaching out until Canada. I hope that in the future, our networks will continue to cross, enabling further collaboration on multimorbidity projects. And I'm looking, much, uh, I'm looking forward very much to continue our European meetings in Maastricht, Paris, and Frankfurt. Enjoy your PhD. Thank you so much to both of you. Thank you. Dear Dr. Makowski, also, on behalf of the Board of Deans of Maastricht University, I would like to congratulate you with the honor you have acquired. Uh, it's time uh, for a uh, reception, I think, uh, but I would like to propose, because some of the members uh, of the committee are online, first to give you the opportunity to have some pictures to, together with everybody, and then we will move to the rafter uh, and then there you can uh, congratulate uh, Dr. Markovsky. Thank you very much. And now ends the academic session now. <laughs>